National Interest this week looks at something very complicated and very fascinating. So to begin with, if you are addicted or even curious about the history of independent India in the pre-Google era, watch Rocket Boys on Sony Lib. In eight episodes, it's a lot about lot of watching, about three full-length feature films worth of time. Yet you will likely watch it non-stop, sort of breathlessly. It's so well constructed. Definitely you will watch it non-stop if you are blank on where and how India's scientific political complex emerged and the challenges, setbacks, heartbreaks and euphoria it faced on its way. And how did a third element, military, got further hyphenated with it? If on the other hand you grew up in that era, you would watch it even more keenly. To see the story you know come alive in brilliant acting, direction and scripting, not necessarily in that order. It would also bring back to you the eternal mysteries that endure in our lives. And that would now haunt a fourth generation of Indians. For example, Dr. Homi Baba's death in that Air India Boeing 707 called Kanchenjunga that crashed into that other great mountain in Europe, Mont Blanc. Now, it, the story goes that it was, a, it was an accident, but there are thereby lie many conspiracy theories and it's still an eternal mystery. That remains unsolved and is prone to many conspiracy theories. Just as there is the death or disappearance of Netaji and Lal Bahadur Shastri's sudden death at Tashkent after signing the accord with Ayub, now I might have written about many different things in my long journalistic career from politics to insurgency to wars to sport and science. One thing I've never written is a movie or art review of any kind. So rest assured, that isn't what I'm going to inflict on you after watching Rocket Boys non-stop, binge watching Rocket Boys. Now professionally, as I'm trained as a reporter and like most others in our profession, in my generation at least, I learned to cover the crime beat first. Call it my suspicious mind if you so wish that I look for theft in what is, after all, just a stirring national, nationalistic teleserial on the lives of two magnificent men, Homi Bhabha and Vikram Sarabhai? But if you combine it with the memories of my upbringing as a child of the 60s, born in the late 50s, grown up in the 60s, the epoch where the legend of the Rocket Boys comes to fruition, I cannot but note a most serious and egregious identity theft. That of Professor Meghnath Saha, among the greatest scientists ever produced in India, a physicist in the class of C.V. Raman, Chandrasekhar Venkat Raman, Jagdish Chandra Bose, Satyendranath Bose, Baba and Sarabhai followed in their wake. This was the golden era of Indian physics. To learn more about this, I called Janvi Falke, a brilliant chronicler and researcher of science history and director of the Science Gallery at Bengaluru. She tells us just how heady this period was. Of the 10 Indian scientists admitted to the Royal Society from the late 19th century until 1940, she tells us, eight were physicists. Now we know that a story needs action, excitement, some heroes and also probably villains. Why not? That this brilliantly produced and tautly constructed Nikhil Advani OTT show picks Baba and Sarabhai as the heroes to the exclusion of all others is forgivable. It's all right. They are at least for real. And in fact, if you start watching with every episode, there's a disclaimer saying that this doesn't mean that others did not play a key role. It's a story essentially about these two. But if the story also needs a villain, must you invent one? There is a villain of sorts, a Calcutta physicist, sort of stocky, dark complexioned, bitter, inferiorly complex, so deeply jealous of Baba, he's open, open to sabotaging his growth. He's not a bad scientist at all. He builds India's first cyclotron at Institute of Nuclear Physics in Calcutta in 1950. He also contests elections for Lok Sabha in 1951 and wins and rises to be a critic of Nehru's. There was indeed in real life a brilliant character that answers most of that description in the villain in Rocket Boys, except his name was Professor Meghnath Saha, not Mahdi Raza, and it is morphed in the show. Now, this is obviously being passed off as creative liberty, and I, I, I won't argue with that. See my colleague Tina Das's article on the print. I will give you a link. 
where she has spoken also with the actors and the filmmakers. In fact, I also called the director Abhay Pannu to understand where he was coming from and whether they deliberately decided to change Meghnath Saha's character into Mehdi Raza. He said that wasn't the intention, but they had to create a character like that, like a, like a rival to Humi Baba to build the story. So that is creative liberty. But my question is, if you had to invent one fictional character in a story which has the unqualified pretense of being real life, if dramatized, and which uses real names and characters from history, did it have to be a villain that never, never existed? The villain for the most part, in fact, is a Shia who once supported Muslim League, was called out by Baba for taking funds from Jinnah to build his Institute of Nuclear Science in Calcutta with a deep anger with Sunni Muslims who apparently dragged out his parents and killed them, mercilessly slaughtered them. A man so vulnerable in his inferiority complex uh, compared to the well-connected entitled Rocket Boys that he's vulnerable even to a CIA trap to subvert India's nuclear program. The case officer assigned by CIA to recruit him, no surprise, is a journalist, again mythical. The filmmakers know who's in bad order these days in these polarized times at this point, Muslims and journalists to begin with. Then Raza is elected from a communist party to Lok Sabha. So that completes the 2022 triangle of evil. Muslim, journalist, communist, right? You might still let it pass. Everybody has to salute the times, right? And we can't miss repeated references also to Made in India at, and Atmir Bharta. Even if sometimes his words are spoken by Nehru, played by brilliantly by Rajit Kapoor, but almost every character has been played brilliantly in this. James Sarab as Baba, Ishwak Singh as Sarabhai, and two female characters in particular. One is dancer Mridalini Sarabhai, and the fact that the Sarabhai has Sarabhai's had a strained marriage with a triangle there has also been brought out very well. In fact, the woman who's acted as Mridalini Sarabhai is really a rare talent. The filmmakers have found her from Southern cinema, and she just speaks, she just speaks with her face and as her eyes with minimal dialogue. There is also the character of Pipsi, who still talked about a great deal in the Parsi circles in Mumbai. She was a kind of partner, love interest of Homi Baba. That's also played very well by Sabazad. And if I if I exclude any others, that's again because I'm not a film reviewer. I just talk about what I observe. So it is a fantastic production and great acting and great direction. And a villain, yes, a villain probably was needed to make this more dramatic, although I will later argue that you could have done without a villain in this case. The story was dramatic enough without that. Again, if you had to have a villain, then a Muslim villain. Now, a Muslim villain has been par for the course in Hindi cinema since the rise of Sunny Deol genre in Bollywood. But did you really have to steal the great Meghnath Saha's identity to create this? And it's doubly unfortunate and silly because if the genuine story of arguments, the interplay of relationships between these great geniuses had been portrayed, that itself would have made an exciting enough story. Why sully it with fictional nonsense? Now, let's get back to who was Meghnad Saha, whose identity we say has been stolen to create this fictional, self-pitying, villainous loser called Mehdi Raza, loser almost till the end. Saha was born in a very poor... Most likely he came from a Dalit family, a Nam Shudra family. Today, most likely it will be a Dalit family. While still in school, he joined protests against Lord Curzon's division of Bengal. It lost him, it lost him his scholarship and sustenance. He was from a very poor family in a village near Dhaka. But he was too brilliant to be left behind. And Calcutta was going through an epoch of scientific renaissance at that time, at Presidency College, where he faced awful discrimination in the Hindu hostel uh, from upper castes, his teachers were titans like Jagdish Chandra Bose and Praful Chandra Ray. The classmate closest to him personally and academically was Satyendranath Bose. Remember him for Bose Einstein statistics and Boson, etc. Together, they wrote the first English translation of the Einstein Minkowski papers laying out the theory of relativity in German. 
they were helped along by another great indian physicist statistician pc malanobis this first english translation published by calcutta university in 1920 made einstein a global celebrity because until then german was the language of global science particularly physics this coincided helpfully with british researcher arthur eddington validating the theory of relativity as well saha went on to conquer new frontiers in physics his greatest and the most enduring contribution is named after him this saha equation i made a phone call to professor anil kakotkar who very graciously uh, gave me time and talked at length now dr anil kakotkar he began his career as a campus recruit under baba in 1964 in 36 36 years he rose to be among his successors in 2000 as the chairman of department department of atomic energy now this call to him was most useful because this explained to us non physicists what how important is the contribution of meghnath saha and what exactly is the meaning of the so called saha equation so he said to me whatever we can make out scientifically by looking at the light emitted by stars these days that needs to employ the saha equation that is how relevant and important and enduring saha equation and his science and his contribution is even now now saha also was as much an institution builder as sarabhai and baba if not more because he worked in tougher pre independence times and he, and he did not come from a privileged background he was the founder of institute of nuclear science in calcutta i am using calcutta because then it was calcutta not kolkata now not some madhi raza and no he took no money from jinnah or thought of going to pakistan before he returned to kolkata he had taught in the physics department at allahabad university from 1923 to 38 1927 he was admitted as a fellow of royal society the center in kolkata that he founded is now named after him he built india's first cyclotron and in 1950 irene joliot Curry, also a Nobel laureate, came to inaugurate it. At any point of time, he was as much a nationalist as Baba and Sara Bhai, enormously more political than them, and willing to take physical risks too. From around 1915 or so, he became a member of the Anushilan Samiti, among the earliest revolutionary or- organizations in Bengal. Established contact with the Gadar Party in the north, and even reached out to Sinn Fein in Ireland. After all, they were all fighting the same common enemy. the british despite all the political and police attention that his activities or rather his extra curricular activities drew he carried on with subhash chandra bose in 1938 he f- helped form the indian planning committee and falke jamvi falke also notes that while he might have had many differences with nehru he actually insisted that nehru be invited to head it because he wanted more of a politician a political leader to head it because he knew that th- that will give it more direction and more tailwind now these three brilliant scientists had diverse world views kakotkar says that baba was aristocratic always thought big and made a sudden switch from theoretical physics at tata institute of fundamental research which he had set up with money from jrd tata and he moved away and set up a new institution that is the center at trombe which later got named after him as baba atomic research center he consciously moved away from theoretical physics to technology kakotkar says because he thought india didn't have the time nor he the patience to wait for theories to transform into something tangible now it isn't as if he hadn't already made his mark in history already baba scattering was a well known phenomenon famous phenomenon elaborated and named after him he elaborated it it was it was named after him later kakotkar tells us he worked with another contemporary to produce what is called as the baba heitler cascade shower theory so top physicist in his own right like him sarabhai also made made his switch from theoretical physics to technology from cosmic ray research to founding isro on the way the great institution builder that he was and he was also from a very distinguished family in amdavad the sarabhai family he had set up this physical research lab and the indian institute of management in amdavad among others you also need to read just wikipedia level history to understand 
that Indian Institute of Science, Bangalore, which has produced more Nobel laureates, it was a result of many of these great minds working together. Raman, Saha, and indeed Baba. Baba, in fact, in the mid 40s, was a board member at Indian Institute of Science as a family, which is Tata family representative. Now, were there differences between them? Show me, show me two brilliant people who fully agree with each other on everything. And I will take two minutes to convince you, to prove to you that they are brilliant people. Brilliant people have disagreements. Baba and Sarabhai had different approaches to institution building. Kakotkar says Baba was mostly intuitive. He found a man and then built an institution or a lab around him. Right? Sarabhai was more patient. He built, he believed in building an institution first and then finding the people. But they both went their own ways and they complemented each other. The Saha Baba disagreement also was over fundamental aspects of India's development. Saha probably because he had seen deprivation and discrimination and poverty, he wanted even science to grow from the grassroots. Baba, because he was the entitled aristocrat, or as that is how Saha saw him, would rather make spectacular achievements in limited areas and, and catapult India to some kind of leadership position. Unlike Baba or Sarabhai, or scientists generally at that time, Saha was also a political risk taker. In 1951, he contested Lok Sabha elections from Kolkata, Calcutta Northwest as an independent supported by some progressive groups and won. In parliament, he argued with Nehru, but also helped him on the planning commission. It is widely acknowledged that it was his scientific creativity and push, intellectual push, that that drove India, newly independent India, towards mega river water projects. The Damodar Valley project was his brainchild too. Meanwhile, even as an MP, he continued to be the professor and dean of science faculty at Calcutta University until his death from heart attack in 1956, ironically on his way to planning commission. Now, Kakotkar says these greats of Indian science disagreed over many things, but shared a strong, deep respect for each other. Baba and Saha wrote what Janvi Falke says, page upon page of letters to each other, often arguing and disagreeing, but oozing with mutual respect and affection. The letter, she says, can be found in Delhi's Nehru Memorial Library. Another way of looking at this is that they disagreed and argued with, with each other as much as the great politicians and freedom fighters of the day. If you want to put their disagreements in perspective, Check out what was happening between Nehru, Patel and Netaji. How many disagreements existed between them and persist even today, even among their followers and those who believe in their respective legacies and so on. So these scientists' journey is best described in that famous old Kavali, Raste alag alag hain, Thikana to ek hai, Manzil har ek, Shaks ko jana to ek hai. People choose different routes but aim to reach the same destination. Now, we have told you all that Saha was, a great physicist, builder of India's first cyclotron, an independent MP in our first parliament, a deeply political revolutionary, Mehdi Raza, who is ghosting him in Rocket Boys, checks almost all these boxes. Now let's see what Saha wasn't. So he wasn't a bitter saboteur. He did not become an MP for Communist Party, any Communist Party. He died in 1956, so wasn't alive to be still fighting with Baba after the Chinese debacle in 1962 and nearly getting recruited to a diabolical CIA plot to quote-unquote take out, which means assassinate Baba. And finally, he wasn't a Muslim, Shia or Sunni, but then that was much too tempting while creating a mostly evil character, a dark evil character around whom the only fictional story was unfortunately built to create some drama. That he was a Mahashudra and most likely a Dalit and has been mostly forgotten in our popular memory since then. Although on his centenary in 1993, Narsimha Rao government issued a postage stamp in his honor. We'll show you a picture of that on my screen. This probably made it that much more convenient to bury his character in what pretends to be a true history and give him a mostly evil, dark, Muslim avatar. In our book, this is a crime on not just history, but on all the ideals 
so dear to people like Saha, Baba and Sarabhai. Remember those incredible scientists were freedom fighters too. In fact, they were freedom fighters first.